And right now it's time for that time when we talk to our special guest. Tonight our thoughts turn to politics, with just under 80 days to go before the next general election. Who do we know that has a shrewd, insightful understanding of how the political horses are lining up? None other than our special guest tonight, the man from Whale Oil himself, Cameron Slater. Cameron Slater, welcome to The Beat Goes On. Good to see you, Jared. Cameron, um, politics, 80 days. I think we've only got 80 days before. Well, it'll the... be a bit less than that, yeah. but um, essentially we're past the past the 90 day mark, past the 80 day mm. mark, and uh, we're heading into the final stretches of the yeah. campaign. And the reality is we're only seeing one party that's really campaigning at the moment, yeah. and uh, that's uh, New Zealand First with Winston Peters. He's out with his bus driving around yeah. the, uh, the provinces. He thinks he's going to make good inroads into the provinces. We know that he's um, onto something there because uh, Bill English and Stephen Joyce and Simon Bridges have come out in recent days uh, saying that National isn't neglecting the, the regions, but that means they're already reacting to Winston's campaigning. Uh, and uh, so it's going to get interesting. You know, we've had the Greens open up on Winston Peters. Um, they have, had, haven't they? Yeah, um, mm. they had uh, one of their uh, senior um, uh, people, uh, Barry Coates, come out and said that even if it causes another election, they're not prepared to do anything with Winston Peters. Mm. So um, I think that's a, a, a suicidal approach to politics to say that you refuse to do something and, if, and even cause an election. And we all know how much elections cost and the voters will punish them for that. Now, Cameron, um, this time, are you feeling any buzz? I mean, the last time, remember there was Kim... I was the buzz last time. Yes, exactly. <laughs> there was Kim.com and there was the... Um, Honey, Honey Harawira. Honey, is it a bit quiet this time? It's a bit quiet this time because um, we haven't got the Labour Party involving themselves in, uh, in, a, in a manufactured hit job. Uh, and they've got a very boring and dull leader uh, in my own polling that I do for my Insight magazine. Um, Andrew Little's on minus 18 in terms of, you know, we ask people, do you have a favourable view of, of the leader and, mm. and do you have an unfavourable view? And then we net that out and he's at a net minus 18. Bill English is at a positive 22, so there's quite a mm. substantial spread. Um, but Bill English, of course, is at least 15 points off where John Key was. Um, so what we've got in this election campaign is two exceedingly dull leaders who are never going to excite anything mm. um, and um, I think Stephen Joyce from the National Party is looking at trying to get some of those you know dog control collars that give an electric shock so that Bill English can wear that <laughs> and in case he says something stupid he gets an electric shock. Um, Andrew Littles uh, knows that he's unelectable by himself so he's plastering all the billboards with Jacinda Ardern. Mm. Um, the media are talking up with what they call the Jacinda effect but it doesn't show in the polls. So the two main parties are led by boring, unappealing politicians. Um, MMP causes politicians to be very vanilla, mm. very boring. And so we're heading into a boring election, um, which... Frank, unless something... Unless something big be, happens, yeah. but, you know, um, it's not going to, I don't think. And you've always been right in the uh, thick of it, haven't you, uh, Cameron, when something big is... If there's blood know, and guts in politics, I'm in yeah. the middle of it usually wielding a knife or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> now, how did you get to be like that, Cameron? Uh, what's your background? Where, where did it all start, Ed, your interest in politics? Um, well, I couldn't help it, really, because my father was involved in politics. Um, what, would, what was your dad? Um, well, dad was once the National Party president. That's before right. Before then, he was the Auckland Regional Chair, and before that, he was the Electorate Chair, and he's been involved in... What was Dad's name? Um, John Slater. John Slater. Know that, yeah, we all yeah. know the name. Now, you grew up in a household that talked politics. It talked politics. We had politicians come through the house, you know, for dinners or lunches, mm. or they'd stay at our house, or they'd stay at our beach house. Um, you know, I can remember me, uh, back in the, in the 90s when um, Bolger was in, and National brought in the hospital surcharge. Well, I was... I was there when it was my grandmother who came up with that idea, actually. Mm -hmm. She called out to all these politicians um, who were talking about how they were going to deal with funding and things like that. And she says, well, if you're staying in hospital, you're not cooking at home, so they should pay for their food at least. <laughs> so that was her idea. You want to blame someone for the hospital surcharges? It was my dearly departed grandmother. <laughs> but, you know, Dad was involved in politics, but it was um, my mum and my grandmother that I 
learnt uh, to ignore the pretensions of politicians mm. and just um, speak bluntly to them. And I've found that politicians, um, most for the most part, are self-serving. Um, and they only get uh, start listening to you if you wield a big stick and a brick. Now, how did you get on with your dad? Um, dad and I don't see eye to eye. I used to sit there and listen to him lobbying politicians or complaining about how the Labour Party were tearing down the signs and Eden Electorate and mm. things like that. And I said, well, why don't you go out and tear your own signs down? Or tear their signs down. Oh, no, we don't play like that. And I said, mm. well, you're going to lose. Yeah. And so my view has always been um, give as good as you get. Um, or give better, and um, and I'm a firm believer in political retribution. So mm -hmm. if someone gets one over on you, well, they get it back one day, but you make it twice as hard is what they gave it to you. Where do you think that came from? Is it from your mother's side? Um, oh, I, look, I can remember mum telling politicians lots and lots of things. You know, yeah. I remember her lecturing Aussie Malcolm just before he got tipped out and, mm. and telling him that he was arrogant and it was behaviours like that that meant that he was going to lose the election. In 1984, they did. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I just witnessed that um, firsthand. You know, Dad would take a conciliatory approach, Mum would take a more brutal approach. And um, she... And you've got your mother's genes? Yeah, I've got my mother's genes. Yeah. And I'm a hunter as well, so, you know, I've got the patience to stalk animals and... <laughs> And wait for them to walk into the site, and I've just applied that to politics as well. So, yeah. What other thoughts did you have about a career? Now you've got a very successful blogging whale oil, but did you have any other? Did you want to be a doctor, a lawyer, or? Anything? I've never really known what I wanted to be. Yeah. I, I went to university mostly to meet my wife and to eat my lunch, <laughs> and. Um, I, um, <laughs> it, well, I wasn't particularly um, good at, especially when I was taking politics papers and there mm. was some Womble professor who'd been there forever, um, who'd never actually been involved in politics but was lecturing on politics and yeah. I thought, well, he's a dickhead. Yeah. And when you have an attitude that the people who are teaching you things are dickheads, you tend not to learn too much. Mm. Um, I've done a lot of things. I've been involved in banking, uh, a lot in technology, around technology. Um, politics grew out of um, me, I guess, sitting there ranting at the television and there never being any outlet to challenge either the reporters or the politicians and the stupid things they were saying until blogging came around. Right. And oh, so, yeah. so I, that's how I got into that. I was basically the classic ranter at the television. Yeah, now that's, that, they stop there. <laughs> Most people can rant at the television and, you know, yell at it, but they never do anything about it. But uh, you, you found a way to do yeah, something. Yeah, I used the technology that was around and yeah. it's developed. And then I didn't want to reinvent the wheel either. Um, too often people try and and come up with their own thing. I'm a classic plagiarist, or at least in style. And so what I did is I looked at who were the best bloggers in the world and why they were the best bloggers. Mm -hmm. And then I picked the best parts of what they did and melded that with the best parts of other bloggers and then put that together. So I didn't invent the tip line. I saw somebody else using that. Um, I didn't invent some of the posts that I do. I saw others doing that. And so I, I took the best of breed and put them all into one and applied that to the New Zealand market. What was your first sign of success? Um, starting to get um, called by journalists to, to assess what I thought about something or being quoted by journalists about, you know, um, and that's when I got the bug for uh, telling stories of uh, investigating what these rat bags were up to calling them out, um, mm. and then all, all of a sudden, of course, I started to break stories as well. So you became a source for copy, didn't you? Yeah, yeah source yeah. for copy. Um, it's funny because they always utilised me as a source for copy, but they didn't even want to pay, and so I had to turn it into into a model that, that was going to work for me, a business that can work for me, and I, and I employ three people now. So, um, yeah, I'm successful at it. There's no one else who's doing that. And it's ironic and all of the people that were criticising me during dirty politics have a lot of them have gone on to develop a similar type of business mm. approach. You know, people like the spin-off, where they sell it, they sell copy. You know, mm. f they they go to businesses and they say, "Well, we'll run some stories and we'll charge you for it." Tell me your best day there when the um, when you felt a great buzz. It's probably when I. I mean, although Lynn Brown didn't resign, I did knock him over, mm. and I did make him politically irrelevant. Yeah. Um, but 
that wasn't really me that did that. He did it through his own actions. I just told the story. Yeah. I wasn't prepared to take the PR line. And I had, I had someone involved and I had affidavits and I had the evidence and I ran the story. And that still is the biggest story that I've ever run yeah. on, on the website in terms of traffic. When did you, um, when you first heard the story, uh, did you believe it or did you... No, I didn't. Right? And I've said this um, publicly. Is yeah. that I originally thought, oh, this is you know, a scorned woman um, situation. Um, she wasn't prepared to swear an affidavit. It was all conjecture and hearsay. You can't run stories on mm. that. Um, I actually hung up on her once. I was sitting on an aeroplane waiting to, to leave Auckland to go to Singapore to speak at a conference. And um, she rang me up. I said, well, you know, the election's in two weeks' time. Are you prepared to swear an affidavit? No. I said, well, goodbye, and hung up on her. I thought it was a dead story. Mm. I thought it was dead, and then the election happened, and then I got a phone call the next day, and now she was prepared to swear an affidavit, and that went from there. Now, people thought that I contrived the situation mm -hmm. uh, to suit one particular p um, person or candidate. That's not true at all. And... Um, you know, it took a while to to get all the pieces together, and then then you know, we just. I've know, forgotten now, but what was the what was the turning point for her? <coughs> what made her uh, decide to sign an, an well, affidavit? Well, I don't know. You'd have you to don't ask know her, yourself, and, yeah. and she yeah. doesn't speak to me and blames me for all the negative publicity that she got. But the end of the end of the day is uh, her and Len Brown were conducting a extramarital affair, or extramarital for him, not for her, um, and they were using council resources. Um, cars and mm. all of those sorts of things. It was a valid story. It was all true, and um, and we ran the story. Um, and if that had been a national politician or if it had been anybody else, I would have still done the same thing. Yes. Now <clears> this <throat> must be a, a funny feeling for you to to know those facts, and I'm going to destroy a person's career now. No, what, they destroyed their own career. Yeah, I realise. I didn't do it. I just told the story. Yeah, but what do you feel at that particular moment? Do you think um, what there's a thing called compassion? Any compassion to? No, these no. are politicians. Yeah. Right. They lie to us uh, professionally. Yeah. And um, you know, I looked at it. Frankly, I actually don't care who someone's running one up. Mm. I, I don't care if someone's gay or whatever. It's when they start lying. It's when they campaign on family, family values. It's when they campaign um, in the churches and talking about marriage and sanctity of marriage and all this sort of thing. Mm. And then you find out that they're actually a, a rotten rooting rat bag. And uh, <laughs> so, so, so yeah. that's when the story becomes yeah. valid. Up yeah. until that point, mm. it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. right? If someone doesn't campaign on those, uh, is single and is running one up every bit of skirt that he can find, well, that doesn't matter. It's when they turn into hypocrites and liars that it becomes a story. Do politicians fear you, Cameron? I've walked into rooms full of politicians and the whole room's gone quiet. So gone quiet, yeah. I'm not sure if it's fear. Um, some respect would, would be, but there would be some that are frightened. Now, so, so the beginning of our... A chat today, Cameron. You know, we expect this. There's not a heck of a lot going on in this particular election. You're feeling that, but so it's in your interest to, to for something uh, saucy to be going on, doesn't it? So well, it just is it a bit disappointing that, that it's it a is. Bit dull? It's MMP. You see, yeah. people are too scared to to make a stand. Mm. They're too scared to to uh, upset people. Every yeah. vote counts. Um, I don't believe in that. I actually believe that if you have some principles and some um, ideals that you should put a stake in the ground and defend it, defend your ground around that, mm. uh, even if you're not going to get all of the vote. The trouble is, is national so large, Labor is supposed to be large, they cover that centre ground and they can't accept those voters. Mm. It's the, the fringes and the edges where it's more exciting and that's why Winston Peters can come out and say, well, we're going to stop this. And I'm, this is a bottom line, and I'm going to do do this and that. He can play at those fringes because he's just trying to pick up one percent there and one percent there to get over that five percent. But he's well over five percent now. Mm. He's and last poll he was at eleven percent level pegging with the Greens. It's likely he's going to end up being the third largest party in Parliament, mm -hmm. and that will be a credible uh, uh, voting block there. Um, that's why he's recruiting um, new blood, um, some older hands too, like Shane Jones. Um, you know, uh, the political elites think that it's terrible that Shane Jones is making a comeback, that he 
you know, bought some porn on, on, at a motel on the on the government credit card. He obviously never heard of uh, iPads and the internet, but <laughs> but um, by and large, most people don't care about that. No. You know, and the way that he approached it when he was busted, he just went, oh, I'm a bloke, I was staying alone, what mm. else was I going to do? Mm. Most of us yeah. think, oh, good on you, mate, yeah. you know, and we don't care. It's only yeah. the political elites, uh, what I call the beltway, that get excited by mm. these things. Most of the public don't care. If Shane Jones had been selected as the leader of the Labour Party, do you think they'd be doing a lot better now? I think they would. The problem with the Labour Party is not is a number of problems. One is that Helen Clark factionalised the Labour Party in order to maintain control. And I don't agree with her politics, but mm. boy, I admire her abilities. So what you've got is a legacy of Helen Clark of average people who aren't too bright who are academic in their approach to politics rather than practical, by and large have never run a business, they've never gone without and while, while they paid their employees' wages, mm. and they, do, they no longer represent their core brand, and their core brand is Labour, which means working. Labour's <laughs> recognised now as being yeah. representative of the criminal classes, the feral classes, the indigent and the losers, basically. Whereas Nat, Nat National has spread themselves across that centre and uh, your electricians and plumbers and self-employed, self-motivated people who are blue-collar in the traditional sense. They've left Labour. And they've left Labour and yeah. they're now over with National because they see that that party represents the values of hard work and doesn't tolerate bludges and, and all of that sort of thing. So Winston Peters, of course, sits across both of those. So the... The Labour voters who can't bring themselves to vote for national this election may look at saying, oh, I'll vote for Winston instead to keep them in check. I don't want national to be the government, but Labour's never going to make it, so I want someone to keep them in check. On the flip side of that, Winston's also going to pick up that soft centre national voters who were previously Labour but can't bring themselves to go back to vote for Andrew Little. And so they'll go, well... The Nats have sort of lost me, they've annoyed me over a couple of issues, but I'm not going to vote Labour, I'll vote for Winston. And that's why I think he is going to become the kingmaker. He is the kingmaker, and the maths doesn't work very well for Labour, and it works very well for Bill English, and he's going to have to get over himself and actually sit down and talk with Winston. I know you're not going to answer this, uh, Cameron, but who are you going to vote for? Um, well, I, oh, yes. I will answer that because oh, you will. Oh, great. Um, I think that the National Party has done a number of things um, in recent years to betray their core vote. Mm. Um, they certainly don't stand for the principles of the founding principles of the party, which was about freedom and enterprise, and free enterprise. Party, that's my dad's party. You know, yep. That's the, the party that stood up to Muldoon in the end you mm. know, and said, no, enough's enough. Um, it's become soft and, and spongy in the centre. Um, there isn't a subsidy that Stephen Joyce isn't um, a fan of. And I oppose all of those sorts of things. I believe in a small fiscally conservative government um, that is socially liberal. And I think that's what most Kiwis are. We don't care who you sleep with. Mm. Uh, we don't care what drugs you take, by and large. Um, but we don't want the government meddling in our business anymore. And we learnt that in the 90s. And... So I think Nationals betrayed a lot of those supporters and um, I do not subscribe to the sycophancy of um, some people who say, oh, well, we can't risk Labour. Well, we've had Labour as governments before. It doesn't last forever. We have elections, we get rid of them and they're gone. But I could never bring myself personally, philosophically to vote for Labour. So that kind of leaves me with either ACT or New Zealand First uh, ACT has no impact. I don't believe it's ever going to have an impact. I think that David Seymour has also betrayed the founding principles of the ACT party. He's more a classical liberal rather than a libertarian type mm. person. Um, and that kind of leaves me with Winston Peters, who you know I've called him corrupt and a, and a rat bag and a thief and <laughs> everything else over the years. But um, you know I actually think that the National Party does need to be uh, pegged back a little bit. I think they do need to mm -hmm. uh, discover some humility and they do need to start listening to their core base. And if someone like me, who's the son of a former president of the party, can no longer bring themselves to support the National Party, well, then they've got problems. 
and they need to learn from that. And instead of criticizing me and saying, I should vote national for the good of the country, I'm actually going to not vote national for the good of the country because unfettered power mm. is always dangerous. So your electorate, your electoral vote will go to Winston? And no, my party. electorate vote will go to uh, Mark Mitchell, who's a National Party candidate. Uh, so you are going to vote for National? Then, yes, and the electorate. Yeah, yeah, right. the electorate. But the party vote's the only one that matters. Yeah, and so and it's going to Winston. It's going to go to New Zealand first, yeah. But technically, mm. given my hobbies, I should be a Green voter. <laughs> right? Because everyone wants... You know, I'm a hunter. Um, I'm in the outdoors all the time. I live yeah. by the sea. Everyone wants clean water, clean mm. oceans, clean rivers, clean air to breathe. Um, we want pest-free bush. You know all of those sorts of things. It's all good. Trouble. Green. That's yeah. all good green stuff. Trouble is, is the lunatics and hardcore socialists, <laughs> and believe uh, rather too <laughs> uh, are rather too fond of other people's money, and mm. I can't support that. So they lose a vote when I should actually be on their side. Will the Greens always remain at that 10%? Um, yeah. Do you think that, yeah. that's, they're destined to be there forever? No, for Sitting outside government, never being in government. Oh, just before you do go, Cameron, because we're running out of time, uh, there was a feeling within the Green Party that we could work with National. Will, will they ever work with National? They'll never work with National yeah. because they're watermelons. And you might think <laughs> that's a joke, but a watermelon's green on the outside and it's bright red on the inside. Yeah. And that's what they are. They're actually unreconstituted communists. And uh, they have some green tinges, but the reality is if you look at all of their solutions, I think you know, David Farrer made a list of more than 100 things they want to ban. Mm. You know, um, they, they always want to increase taxes. Uh, they're always, if they just stuck to environmental issues, That'd then be, I think they could. Yeah. But they're not. They're actually not environmental. They want to change the social scene, don't yeah, they? Yeah, they want to change the social scene. Could you ever say that the Greens were a party for fun? No, I don't, I don't, think, yeah. I don't think they're... They'd want to ban too many They'd things. They'd want to ban fun, wouldn't they? Well, they probably yeah. have got it on their list. <laughs> <laughs> Cameron, look, uh, we've had a fabulous chat about politics because it's, as you say, it's 80 days away or less than 80 less days Less than away. 80 days, yeah. And uh, I'd love you to come back and give us some um, more insight on sure, what's happening. Sure, happy to. Yeah, we need to talk politics for the next 80 days, don't we? So, um, well, I think we need to talk policy. Yeah. And um, Bill English is not going to talk policy gets himself in trouble uh, too much. Stephen Joyce pulls what remains of his hair out, mm. uh, wondering if uh, Bill English is going to make his stuff up. Um, Andrew Little, every policy they launch gets torn apart within 24 hours. It's not, mm. There's not a lot of thinking that's going into theirs. Mm. Um, you know, Winston's got some ideas. I think some of them are daft. But there's no perfect party that anyone can support that, that delivers 100% of what you want. So, A lot to talk about. So you're going to be busy typing over the next 80 days? Absolutely, and we're going to be launching some podcasts as well. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. Cameron, thank you very much. You're welcome. Giving us a good insight into the whole what's going on out there. Oh, politics is a dirty game played by dirty, despicable people. <laughs> thank you, Cameron.